This is the 15th message in a series on prophecy, and we've been talking to you about the rapture, and I'd like to take a few minutes this morning to set the scene for this message this morning. There was a time when I held a general view of the future. This time was before I became a Christian and before I began to study God's Word. But there was a time when I held to the general scheme of the future that most folk hold to today. I envisioned a time out yonder in the future when suddenly time would be no more. I referred to it in my mind as the end of time, for it seemed to me that there must be some period of time when God would stop whatever it is he's doing here upon the earth and there would be a reckoning day or a judgment day. And I thought that when the end of time came, then all men would stand before God, great and small, and they would be judged according to their works, and each man would either perish or be given eternal life at that time, would either pass into heaven or pass into hell, depending upon what his works would be. And then when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing that changed my thinking was in the knowledge that salvation had nothing to do with the works of men. Salvation depends upon and hinges upon the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not what we do for God that saves our souls. It is what he has done for us. It is not what we offer to him, but it is what Jesus has offered to God. It is not the sacrifices we make, but the sacrifice he has already made. And it is not the cross that we bear, as the religious world sings, but it is the cross which he has already borne that makes us just in the sight of God. The Bible declares man ruined spiritually. It declares him depraved from his mother's womb by inheritance. Sinner by nature and a sinner by choice and a sinner by practice. He is possessed of a heart that is desperately wicked and deceitful above all else. He never learns it and never knows how to control it. And so like a sheep going astray, he consistently turns to his own way. And it caused God to lay upon our Lord Jesus the iniquities of us all. And so when I learned that the finished work of the Lord Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, had propitiated God, not my works, my morality, or my righteousness, for I had none, then it seemed quite clear to me that there could be no general judgment when men's works would be reviewed and a determination as to his eternal destiny made. Then as the scripture began to be made clear to me, such verses as, He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. I realized that our destinies are sealed here, now, in this life. We are either saved or we are lost this morning. We either have rested in Jesus and in his finished work for our redemption and our righteousness in the sight of God, or else we are still depending upon our works, still depending upon our righteousness, still depending upon what we are or what we shall do to pacify God. So we are saved or lost, which eliminates the necessity of all men being brought to judgment. Some true will be brought to judgment, but not all. Just as Paul says, we shall not all sleep, he might just as well have said, and he did in other words, we shall not all be judged. For there is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall never come into condemnation or judgment, but is passed from death unto life. And we are told in that glorious book of Romans that we have already been to judgment. We went there in the person of our substitute and our Savior. He stood at judgment for us at Calvary. He answered to God in our behalf. He received from God the just sentence of his word and his law, suffered the wrath of Almighty God poured out upon him, 
died in the separation that belonged to us, plunged into the outer darkness that awaited us, and was raised from the dead without our sins as proof positive that what he did in our behalf was acceptable to God. This is the substitutionary atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. And every Christian believes it. For this is the way we are made Christians. So as I began to study the Bible, the scheme of the future became clearer and clearer. Jesus left with his church, which is composed of all those who have rested in him for righteousness. He left with his church this glorious promise that he would come for them again at an unannounced time, in a moment the twinkling of an eye. He would catch away, rapture, snatch away all those who belong to him. The dead in Christ, as far as their bodies are concerned, will be raised at that time. And the living saints, the survivors, the leftovers, will be caught up in the air together with them to meet the Lord Jesus. And there they will ever be with the Lord. This event could happen this morning. It could happen this hour. It could happen this moment. It is imminent. We are looking to heaven for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This does not make us fanatics. It just writes into life a blessed hope. It gives to us the glorious encouragement that this may be our very last day here, that tomorrow we may be in the presence of our Lord Jesus. The blessed truth of the rapture is not fanaticism. It is the only rational, reasonable hope that the believer has at this present time. We look for him. We're not looking for judgment, not for the end of time. We're looking for him. We're not looking for anything to happen in the political world, though things will happen. We're not looking for any change in world governments, though there will be changes. We are looking for him. He is our bridegroom, and we are his bride. He is our beloved, and we are his. We've been joined to him, wedded to him, united to him by faith in that marvelous experience called salvation, which is really, in essence, falling in love with Jesus. And now we wait. Our life is wrapped up in his. Our destiny is his. Our hope is in him. And if this event takes place this morning, life will go on in this present world. The civilization about us will continue for a season. For God has many things yet to work among the unsaved in the time that will come to pass after the rapture. So I don't want you to think of the rapture as the end of time. It isn't. It is the end of the age of grace. If you will read in the book of Revelation at chapter 4, when you have time, you will see a picture of the rapture in the prophecy of that, fir of that first portion of, of chapter 4. John sees a door open in heaven. And he finds himself in the Spirit and mysteriously caught up through that door into heaven at the very throne of God. Now Jesus said in John 10, I am the door. So John was in the Spirit and by faith caught up through Christ, God the Father. And there he stood before the throne. It is the type of the rapture. For when Jesus descends from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise and the living will be caught up. And through the door, the Lord Jesus, they will return to heaven. So what interests me at this point is what follows that picture of the rapture in Revelation 4. What follows is that instantaneously with the rapture, there is a change takes place in the throne of God. For the very next verse tells us that suddenly out of the throne there came thunders and lightning and a tremendous manifestation that would strike fear into the hearts of men. It was associated with a holy God, for when the thunder and the lightning began and proceeded out of the throne, the four living creatures which were before the throne of God rose up and they began to say in unison, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. 
They begin to announce that power and dominion belonged to him, that honor and glory was to be given to him. And this is a tremendous change in the throne of God for up to this point in the New Testament. We hear the throne of God spoken of as the throne of grace. It's a place where grace proceeds, where a loving God calls sinners to repentance through Jesus Christ, offers them blood redemption, offers to make them kings and priests forever. But now suddenly the throne is changed, for God is not dealing at this time with the world in grace. The age of grace has ended with the rapture, and the church is removed. And God manifests his throne as a throne of judgment. What will happen on the earth at this point? That's where we begin this morning. Will there be anybody saved? Who will be saved? Will you be saved? Why? These are the questions. Can you picture this earth as it would be at that moment? Supposing the rapture should take place this morning. In a moment of twinkling of an eye, instantaneously and mysteriously, every real born-again believer will be removed from this earth. Now notice that I did not say every church member, nor did I say every religious person, nor did I say every good person and every moral person. But what I am saying is that those who have been washed in Jesus' blood by faith, those who have been joined to him, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, members of his body, the true church, that's the people that will be taken away. And if you can picture this earth at the time that happens, and I tried to this morning, and the more I thought about it, the more distressed I became. And a passage of Scripture in Philippians 2 came to my mind where Paul says of the believer that in this present crooked, perverse generation, he was as a, a luminary, shining in the darkness and holding forth the word of life. That's what I felt like I was doing yesterday, holding forth the word of life. Can you imagine for a moment every true believer gone? No luminaries left in this present world. And I don't care what you think. You know in your hearts that I tell you the truth when I say that only the believer has any light to offer in this world. That light is Jesus. It isn't his light. The believer doesn't have any light. He's a luminary. The moon is a luminary. It absorbs the light of the sun, reflects it. We only reflect a light which is not natural to us, a light which is not in us by nature, a light which does not belong to us, nor does it emanate from us. This light is Christ. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He means by that that those who follow after him they shall not walk in darkness, because in them will be the light of life. Through them will be the light of the life of others. And so here we are, Paul says, in this crooked, perverse generation as luminaries. Our businesses give out light. You know, if you were burning kerosene lamps like Henry Nestor did, there were a couple of things that had to be done to them constantly, and one was clean the globe, the chimney, and the other was trim the wicks. And these are the two things that need to be done in us from time to time, the cutting away of that which is superfluous, the keeping clean of that which the light shines through. So here we are, the luminaries. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And suddenly all the light that's in the world is removed. And if the light be in thee, that is in thee be darkness. How great shall that darkness be, Jesus offered as a proposition one time. And if the only light, true spiritual light that's in this world is taken away, how great will be the darkness that follows. 
We are in this crooked, perverse generation, Paul says, those are his words, holding forth the word of life. The holding forth phrase comes out of the Greek. Two word pictures are found in it. One is of a mother offering to a hungry, fretful child the milk of her breast. And the other picture is of a man holding forth a cup of cold water to a thirsty traveler. And this is the picture Paul paints in the book of Philippians of the Christian. He goes through this life, <clears throat> offering to other believers the sincere milk of the word of God, sharing with him that milk which has been given to him by Christ who is in him, and offering to a thirsty, weary world of travelers the refreshing waters of the water of life. Think of it. The church is gone, and there is no more water offered, no more light to shine, no more sincere milk of the word of God to be given to those who are hungry and fretful. This is a picture of the world without the Christian. The Christians are despised. True Christians are. You say, well, I take objection to that. Well, read the Bible. Paul says that if we will to live godly, we shall suffer persecution. Jesus said in the 15th chapter of John, he said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. Is a servant greater than his Lord? The world is despi despises the believer. He is rejected of the world as Christ was rejected. And in spite of the lowly position, despised and base, Paul describes us in 1 Corinthians, the world will at last know the true value of the believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. When the light goes out, when the water of life is no longer offered, we are described as ambassadors. When the ambassadors are withdrawn, we are told that we are ministers of reconciliation. When the message of reconciliation is no longer preached, Peter says that we are priests unto God with the ability and the privilege of offering unto God spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. And when the priesthood is removed, and that's the priesthood of all believers. What will this world be like? At the moment of the rapture, there will not be a solitary person upon the face of the earth who has access to the throne of God by prayer. I remember the time when I scoffed at the prayers of God's people. I said, pray for me if you will. What is that to me? There will be a time when the people of this earth We'll long for one man, one woman, one boy or girl who could reach the ear of God and name their name. When the priests are gone, brethren, what shall it be like? When there are no more sweet-smelling offerings of incense rising from this earth to the nostrils of God to keep him in his place and to prevent him from turning his throne into a throne of wrath to deal with a world that's rejected what will it be like, brethren, when the priests who have fed upon the showbread and walked in the light as he is in the light and have had that precious access to him through Jesus Christ, our God? What will it be like when the ambassadors are gone and no way to contact that foreign power that threatens in judgment? What will the world be like when the ministers of reconciliation are gone? And there's not a soul upon earth who knows how God was in Jesus Christ reconciling the world unto himself and not imputing their trespasses unto them. What will it be like when not a soul on earth knows the real meaning of Calvary or the preciousness of Jesus' blood, nor the peace and joy and the forgiveness of sins that there is by that offering? Now, do you see why we raise a question, will anybody be saved? But you say, I'm not saved this morning, and I've heard the gospel. And if the rapture should take place this morning, I will know the gospel. We shall see. What will it be like on earth when suddenly every Christian disappears? An office worker does not show at his desk at 8 o'clock, as he's supposed to. 
A plant foreman is missing, but he didn't call in sick. A clerk from a store is gone. A truck driver disappears mysteriously from his truck. Hospital beds are found empty, but no doctor dismissed his patients. Jail cells are found vacant, and I'm sure that there are some who will go to heaven from jail. Paul was one of the most celebrated prisoners of history. He went to heaven from jail. Isn't that wonderful? He went to the arms of Jesus from a dungeon in Rome with chains upon his wrists and upon his feet. He declared a malefactor by man, a criminal, but declared by God a saint, a priest unto God, a minister of reconciliation, an ambassador of Christ, and a child of God. Jail cells will be found vacant, school desks, and their seats will be empty. Teachers will be missing, and I hope some preachers. There will be changes in people's families. Families will be divided. Read in the Gospels. I'm sorry that it's that way, but it's true. Two shall be in a bed together. That's husband and wife. It could be brother and sister, or brother and brother, sister and sister. One shall be taken, the other left. Mothers will be missing. Fathers will be gone. Children will be absent. Without a word. Without an explanation. Just suddenly. Not locally. Not regionally. Not nationally. Worldwide. The alarm is spread here when one misses a member of the family. He's only told by the police department that, lady, we got troubles enough. We've had a hundred calls this morning of missing persons. And soon it is on every news network in the United States. Some mysterious happening has taken place. Some phenomenon. Hundreds are missing all over this country. Hundreds are missing all over the world. You notice I'm conservative in my estimate because I don't know. Who knows? All I know is that the word says many are called and few are chosen. And when did Jesus' disciples ask him who then can be saved, he answered, Few. He also said that when he came again, would he find the faith at all upon the earth? He said that generation would be like the generation of Noah's time. And Noah and seven members of his family were in the ark, and that's all. And he said that generation would be like the generation that went out of Sodom, and it was Lot and his two daughters that were spared. That's few in any way you want to look at it. And the answer of the Bible is few. But all over the world, their presence, while ignored at this present time, their absence will be felt. I do not believe that you can remove a Christian from his community, from his place in society without making a hole that can't be filled. He has light, whether anyone wants it or not. He has truth, whether anyone will believe it or not. The very fact that he exists there, he need not preach, he need not testify. That isn't necessary to the proof that there is light in him. He need only exist there, and Jesus has existed there, and the Holy Spirit has existed there, and has held forth the opportunity of the way of life from day to day. And I think that wherever Christians are missing, their absence will be found. I think the plant will not be the same where Christians work. I think men will come and say, where's that fanatic that used to run this machine? Talked all the time about Jesus. Talked about Jesus coming out of the sky, pie in the sky, man. What happened to him? He hasn't been here today, nor yesterday, nor the day before, nor the day before. Where is he? What's happened to that funny man who used to come in the store on Monday morning? And every now and then he'd talk about Jesus. He hasn't been in here for several Mondays. Where is he? Did you hear about this strange happening? They came by so-and-so's house and they were all missing. No trace has been found of them. The car's in the driveway. His Bible lie open on the desk. His clothes are in the closet. 
the shoes by the bed, food on the table, they're gone. Not a word, not a trace. Absolutely is going to baffle the finest detective minds in the world. Sherlock Holmes himself can't solve a mystery like that. As far as the reports begin to filter in to the great news centers around the world, one alarming fact will become clearer and clearer. But the disappearance of all of these hundreds of people was simultaneous. It wasn't that one disappeared on Monday and one on Tuesday and one on Wednesday and one on Thursday. It was that the sum total disappeared in a moment the twinkling of an eye. <clears throat> now that excites me and that thrills me. And I wish it were now. Because I don't think it could happen to a nicer bunch of guys. I think they should have a problem like that. <laughs> And that will be a major problem. I think, and I'm just speculating, and I, I do press upon you that anything beyond what the Scripture says is only speculation, and my speculation is no better than anyone else's. However, things do follow a course, don't they? And you can almost reach out there in your mind and imagine what will happen. First of all, when it becomes apparent that this mysterious thing has happened at the same time, irrespective of geographical location, from every nation, tongue, tribe, and people, from every walk of life, from every social strata, from every race, from every conceivable category or strata of civilization, these people have disappeared. When this becomes apparent, I'm sure that it will result in some kind of a mild or perhaps more than mild panic because it is the fear of the unknown that causes panic. And I think it will sweep this country and it will sweep this world like a wave. Where have they gone? Where have they gone? What's happened? And what will happen to us? If this many people have disappeared, maybe we'll disappear. Where did they go? What caused them to vanish? What's the future hold? And they're going to turn immediately to government because that's where panic finally comes to rest, is with the government. And the government is just panic looking for some place to happen anyway. So they turn to the government for an answer. The president calls his cabinet. In a hastily called emergency session of the cabinet, they decide that a full-scale congressional investigation is in order. But that's the only way they know how to handle these things. The chiefs of staff are called in, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, they're all called in. All troops are placed upon an alert, for this may be something that has come from our enemies. The national security is at stake. Every power available to our government and every power available to the governments of the world will be employed to solve this mystery and to do it quickly that we might be prepared, or they might be prepared, for what will follow. That's not too unreasonable, is it? It's exactly what will happen. It has to. But I think this, and this is just the introduction, I think this, I think that the ultimate burden to solve this problem that burden will ultimately, is what I mean to say, rest upon a different group than the government. I think it will rest upon organized religion of our time. You say, why is that? Oh, I think the government will in desperation turn to organized religion for a spiritual answer. No human answer will be found. No scientific answer will be found. No military answer will be found. There will not be a sane, rational, reasonable explanation given by the accumulated brain power of this country for the mysterious, simultaneous disappearance of hundreds of hundreds of thousands of souls from the face of the earth. Now, this happened once before. As the rapture was foreshadowed in Enoch, 
and in Elijah, there is one passage of Scripture that sheds light upon the ideas the world will have after the body of Christ has disappeared. It's so simple. The church is the body of Christ. Was there a time when the body of Christ disappeared? Yes. Now, if you read the accounts given by the four evangelists together, you will find that Mark, Luke, and John deal with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the disappearance of his body in regards to the believer. All the evidence that's given has to do with the believer. It's about Mary coming to the tomb. It's about the angels telling the women to go tell the disciples that Jesus was alive and that he would appear in Galilee. But Matthew gives to us an evaluation of the reaction of the resurrection upon the world. Now, if you'll turn to Matthew 27, you'll see in verse 62 these words. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now if you turn to verse 12 of the next chapter, and when they were, or verse 11, now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, quote, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Unquote. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money, they did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Isn't that a wonderful story? It's the only time in history that the body of Christ ever disappeared. And the body of Christ did disappear. It remains today, that is, to the unbelieving heart, the greatest miracle of all history, the only unsolved, perfect crime. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from faith, has been pursued by the finest minds of the past 19 centuries. Detectives have worked upon it like an imaginary mystery story, and they have never yet come up with a logical conclusion. And I have to confess that these dum-dums came up with a winner when they said, go tell that the disciples have stolen his body. Can you imagine? Eleven frightened men. <laughs> and all of those eleven men put together couldn't have raised five dollars if they had totaled everything they had. These eleven vagabonds, most of them fishermen, these eleven members of the human race, referred to as unlearned and unlettered men in the book of Acts, riffraff, rabble, fanatics, these eleven men conceived a way to defy the entire Roman army the entire power of organized religion, defy Caesar himself, and perform such hocus-pocus there at the tomb that they must have drugged or hypnotized those soldiers on guard, took the body out without breaking the seal on the great stone, and removed it in such a way that he left the grave, they left the grave clothes wrapped up like a cocoon in the shape of the body, and so successfully hid it that it has not been found to this day. And they did it in 72 hours, without money, without help, without influence. 
And yet the only picture we see of these 11 men during this time is that they're scared to death. They're behind doors that are locked for fear of the Jews. And they themselves don't believe that he'll come back from the dead. <laughs> yet these are the guys that perpetrated this fraud. And let me tell you something. The Roman Empire would have given all it possessed to find the body of Jesus. And the organized religion of that time that crucified him would have given more than that to have found it. For they could have stamped the lie to everything he said if they could have discovered his body. It was never found. It was never solved. And the rapture will never be solved. And the body of Christ will never be found when it disappears. All of the minds, the accumulated minds of Jesus' time were employed in the solving of that mystery and they failed. The power of Rome couldn't find out the truth because they did not believe the truth. They could have known if they had simply believed his words. He said, I will rise again. That's too simple. He says, now the church will rise again. It will be taken away, but it's too simple. The world says, I can't believe such a fantastic thing as that. I can't accept such a preposterous thing as that. That the body of Christ should disappear and not leave a trace. This body disappeared, and there was no trace ever found of it. Raised by the power of God, according to the clear promise of God, the body of Christ simply vanished. And I heard one time a poor stupid man explaining that the angel came and opened the tomb and let him out. And if you'll read the account of the resurrection, you will find that he was already gone when the stone was rolled back. And the stone was rolled back to show those women that he was gone. He said, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which is crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Behold the place where they lay. And they looked in, and the disciples came, and Peter and John ran into the sepulcher, and they looked. And the, the cloth that had covered his face neatly folded and laid in his place, but the grave clothes were undisturbed. He was wrapped in a winding sheet, dear friends, like a cocoon like a mummy, but the form was there. The winding sheet remained in its original form. The contours of his body was seen, but he was gone. Gone from a sealed tomb, from a winding sheet, from a sepulcher that had been made sure by a whole watch of Roman soldiers. Stolen away by disciples, indeed. Resurrected by the power of God. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, he was caught up unto God and to his throne. And he saw Mary in the garden that morning, and he said, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And there he went into heaven's mercy seat and sprinkled his precious blood and obtained an eternal redemption for us. Now I want you to notice that it was the chief priests and Pharisees who went to Pilate. Now, they were shook up about the possibility of the resurrection. This was the organized religion of their time, and this is something that's not generally preached in the organized religion of our time. We don't like the remembrance, but it is solemnly true. The ministerial alliance of Jerusalem crucified Jesus. Now, look that up in your funk and wagon. Organized religion, its leaders, its appointed rulers, its chief priests, crucified the Lord of glory. They could not tolerate him to live, for he was the end of religion. Religion must end when men come to Jesus Christ. Forms and rituals and doctrines and creeds use, lose their power and their meaning when men are brought face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ who is a living person. He was the death knoll for all of religion. And so they crucified him to cover up their sin. And they patched the veil together that God tore in two from top to bottom. And they offered their sacrifices and chanted their chants and said their prayers and burned their incense. 
and went on to deceive men, and they thought that they had killed the truth and could keep it buried. The truth always will be resurrected. You can bury it for a season, but it will come back to haunt you, and it will always be resurrected, and Christ was resurrected on the third day to stamp the lie to all religion that promises to bring men to God apart from Jesus Christ. And so it was the chief priests and Pharisees. It were these men, the rulers, the leaders of organized religion that had the most to lose. And it was these men who trembled in their boots at the thought of the resurrection. And just to make sure that no fraud was worked upon the people so that the last era be worse than the first, these good, pious, religious theologians went to see Pilate, and the organized church has always worked hand in hand with the political power of its time to the destruction of true believers. History verifies it. So in they came. Have a little problem, Pilate. Oh, what is it, fellas? Glad to help you out. You always help us out. We need you. Well, it's about this Jesus. And then these religious infidels express perfectly what they think of Jesus Christ. He's a deceiver. And everything he preached was an error. And everything he said was a lie. But just to make sure that everything he said was a lie, and to make sure that the disciples don't work some fraud upon the people, we need a little help. How about letting us have a detachment of soldiers? How about sealing the tomb? You know what that meant? It meant sealing it with the seal of the Roman Empire. And that's a no-no. You just don't touch that seal when it's put on anything. And so Pilate said, that's all right. And so they sealed that tomb so that anyone who violated that seal on that tomb must answer to Rome. Sudden, instantaneous death is the penalty for the violation of that which is sealed by Rome. A detachment of soldiers is placed on 24-hour guard duty, round the clock, to watch for any band of ruffians who may come and want to tamper with that stone and steal away that body. We don't want this deceiver, this preacher of error, fulfilling his words. They expected a fraud. And when it happened, even though I am sure in my own mind as I think this through, these men had to know in their hearts that nobody stole him. They couldn't have been as stupid as to examine the evidence and continue to be convinced by the evidence that he was stolen. It was a case of willful rejection of truth, a case of willful blindness. They had heard the gospel, and I hope you get the point, but they couldn't find it in their hearts to believe it the day of the disappearance of the body. Many of you have heard the gospel. If you are left when the rapture takes place, neither will you find it in your heart to believe the gospel the day of the rapture. Though the evidence will verify what you suspect, though you will look around and see that simultaneously the saints of God have disappeared, and even though your head will remember that that deceiver said it would happen, you will find no faith in your heart to accept what your head tells you is true. Saving faith isn't conjured up in your mind. It is worked in your heart by the power of God through the instrument of the Holy Spirit using the Word of God. And all of this will change when the rapture takes place. Men foolishly believe that any time they want to get saved, they will. But God is not mocked. And what men sow is what they reap. And you sow unbelief and you will reap an eternity of unbelief. For there will be a time God promised it in his word when his spirit would no longer strive with men. When Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews, he suspected that hour was at hand, for the rapture was imminent even then. And he pled with his listeners with words like these. 
today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. He reminded them of the days of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness, when men daily heard the word of God and refused it, and then there came a time. He called it the day of God's provocation, when he dealt with them in judgment and in wrath, and they no longer heard his voice. These Pharisees, these chief priests, had heard him teaching and preaching daily in the temple and in the marketplace. They had heard the blessed word of God from the lips of Jesus Christ. They had heard him say, I will be crucified, but I will rise again. They heard him say, Destroy the temple of my body, and in three days I will raise it again. They had heard him say, I am he that came down from heaven, and I will go back to heaven. They heard him say, No man takes my life but I lay it down on myself, that I might take it again. They had heard these blessed words from his mouth, and called him a deceiver to his face, a liar, a demon-possessed man who was working for Beelzebub, the chief of devils. Accused him of being the bastard son of Mary, and marked him with the humiliation of calling him the seed of fornication throughout all of his earthly ministry. They badgered him and hounded him, lied about him and schemed against him, persecuted him and hated him, until they took him outside Jerusalem and nailed him to a cross, crowned him with thorns, and killed him. There was organized religion that did that. It was not Attila the Hun. It was organized, intellectual, religious, moral, good, righteous men who loved their own works of righteousness better than they loved God's righteousness in Christ, who turned to their own darkness instead of to his light, who despised him because he brought into the light of God's word the works of their own darkness. These are the men who heard him preach who knew the gospel as well as he did, but couldn't believe it before or after the disappearance of the body. Now, what will the religious world do when the rapture takes place? They will do precisely what this group of men did. They assembled. They don't know anything else to do but have a business meeting. And so they called an emergency business meeting of the chief priests and Pharisees. I can almost imagine that meeting. Sometime, as I think about it, I can almost see myself there in the little corner listening. Here's this huge, solemn assembly hall. Here comes the high priest himself with all of the robes of his office. Here come the chief priests. Here come the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes. And they sit in their certain sections, like the House of Representatives. The Sanhedrin, 72 members. The Supreme Court of Israel is there. Joint session. And the high priest gets up, and obviously he's provoked, and he's flustered, and he's perplexed, he's frustrated. And he calls the meeting to order. There is this disorder throughout the entire hall. The meeting will come to order. We have a serious matter. Some ruffians have stolen the body of Jesus. I knew it was going to happen. Brethren, do you know what this will mean to the general public? Do you know that if this word leaks out, we're going to have general panic throughout this empire? Do you know that if that rip rap and rabble begin to tell this around this city what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. We're going to have riots and burnings and looting. We're not going to have that in this beautiful city. Now, we better come up with a solution fast, and we better get the word out how things are going to happen. The questions are asked. Oh, oh. How did they steal his body? Well, I don't know that, you idiot. How would you expect me to know? All I know is that the tomb was violated, the, the stone was rolled back, the seal was defied, the soldiers were drugged or hypnotized. 
And while they're having the meeting, there's a knock at the door. And the doorman goes back and he says to the high priest, Your Honor, sir, I don't know how you address a high priest. Your Honor, sir, some of the soldiers are here that were on guard at Jesus' tomb. They'd like to tell their story. Bring them in. And they stand up there and tell the truth. The only truthful men in the whole bunch. They tell the truth. They weren't drugged. And they weren't hypnotized. They weren't attacked. No, they didn't see anybody. No, there was no violation of the door. No, the seal was intact. When the discovery was made that he was gone. An angel rolled back that tomb door and opened it. And when it was opened, the grave clothes, they said, were just like they were when he was in them. The napkin was folded neatly and in its place. And we've checked out these disciples. They're all huddled in our little upper room with the doors bolted and the windows locked. They're scared to death. They never stole the body of Jesus. For well, they themselves don't even believe that he's been raised from the dead. And I hear that high priest say, enough of this, enough of this. I have a solution. I don't care what you say happened out there, and I don't care what the evidence shows. You know, men and brethren, as well as I stand here, that there can't be any other logical explanation for it. They have stolen that body, and we will find it in time, so we just as well give the news for what we know to be the truth. Look here, you soldiers. People are going to believe you because you were there. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. After having counsel here, we've decided to give you a large sum of money. Now, I know policemen don't make too much money. Soldiers don't make too much. How would you fellows like to have a nice, big, fat bonus? Well, here's the way you can earn it. Go down into the city. People are going to interview you. Press will be looking you up. They'll be asking you, what really happened? What really happened? Now, I don't care what you think. That doesn't matter. We are telling you what happened because we know. Now, you go tell that those disciples came and stole the body. One of the soldiers says, well, that isn't the truth. Shut up. Who are you to decide what the truth is? We decide what the truth is. That's what organized religion is all about. They have decided what the truth is. In complete rejection of the Word of God and in complete rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will arbitrarily tell the world what the truth is and the truth will arbitrarily be accepted or else. Who are you to decide what the truth is, young man? And the soldier says, well, well, it's okay, I don't mind telling a lie. Don't get me wrong, but if the governor finds out, I'm dead. Now look, son, we got friends in Washington. We got friends in the governor's office. You go tell your story. And if it comes to the governor's ears, we will convince him. The Greek says we will pacify him. Because governors like a little extra money every now and then too. We'll pacify him and we'll secure you. We'll tell him that you didn't have anything to do with it. That we fixed it all up, worked it all out. You go do it. So they took the money and they did as they were taught. And oh, as I read that, it is a prophetic statement of what people are doing all over the world this morning. They're just simply doing what they've been taught. And those soldiers were taught by the biggest professional liars in the history of the world. And the millions of people today are being taught by professional liars. And they're going out to do their dirty work for them. Simply doing what they were taught. I did what I was taught for 23 years. And had I kept on doing what I was taught, I would have gone to hell. Men will do anything they're taught for money, unless they're saved. So they went out, and they told the story, 
And the organized religion gave the announcement. I see the high priest coming out on his balcony with a big smile. Peace, 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 peace. We have an announcement. Don't anyone panic about the disappearance of Jesus now. Oh, I know it seems rather mysterious, but there's really a very logical explanation, dear friend. Those thieving, lying disciples stole his body out of the tomb. And, oh, friends, you know anybody that would desecrate the graves of the dead? What terrible people they must be. That's the reason the disciples had a hard way to go in Jerusalem, brothers. For many a week after the resurrection, they were hounded. They were fugitives of justice. They walked on the street and people spit when they passed. They were sold to the public as grave robbers. And the religious world did it. That's the reason the believer's reputation isn't too swift. <laughs> That's the reason people badmouth God's people all the time. Because they're brainwashed by a system that is satanic and is controlled by the spirit of Antichrist. And you mark my words, when the rapture takes place, the world's and national council of churches will have a meeting. And they'll give a joint announcement along with the Roman pontiff of a very logical and a very simple explanation for the mysterious disappearance of so many people from the face of the earth. In fact, it may even be revealed to the Pope in a dream and a vision. Why, you never can tell Eugene Carson Blake might come up with the answer. Because I'm positive you're going to be here. If Bishop Pike doesn't die from tranquilizers, he'll be here and he'll come up with something. Because he's an infidel. Infidel isn't a bad word, just an unbeliever. He's an unbeliever, he doesn't believe anything. But that liar teaches thousands of people. And they do what they're taught. And they worship at these shrines. And they wouldn't believe a thing Jesus Christ said nor listen to five minutes of his word. We're back here in this chapter in Matthew, brethren. We're right here. And you can read what's going to happen on earth after the rapture. It's here in black and white. When the body disappears, there will be a great announcement made by the religious world. Now you say, why does the burden of proof rest upon them? Why, why wouldn't it rest upon them? <laughs> They're the ones who denied this truth. They're the ones who said it was all poppycock. They're the ones who said it's fanaticism. They're the ones who said, why, that's pie in the sky. We have to have a gospel and a preaching of the Bible that's relevant to our times. They are the men who have been teaching the people. And they will brainwash them once more in the greatest masterpiece of the religious world. A great lie as to what has happened to the true church. Someone asked me not long ago that if the major denominations in this country preach the rapture, and if not, why not? And the answer is simply, the rapture has to do with the disappearance of the body of Christ. And since the leaders of denominationalism, by practice and by teaching, generally deny the existence of such a body, how could they hope to know anything about the destiny of that body? And how could they find any faith to believe in the mysterious disappearance of a body they do not believe to exist? That's what organized religion, dear people, is all about. It is an open rejection of the body of Christ itself. For any sane man knows that the Methodist Church isn't the body of Christ. And any sane man knows the Baptist church isn't the body of Christ. And any sane man knows the Episcopal church isn't the body of Christ. And any sane man knows that all the Christians in the world are not Catholic. And all the Christians in the world are not uh, Nazarenes or Apostolics. But all the Christians in the world are not Camelites or Presbyterians. Any sane man knows, if he'll think about it long enough, that Christians are those who have believed in Jesus. Yet denominationalism, with all of its power, 
and with all of its program, labors day and night to divide Christians one against another and to keep the reality of that body from being manifest in our time. It's the reason it warmed my heart yesterday when that man said, Brother, some of us recognize that there are others not of this fold who love Jesus. What he was meekly saying was that there may be such a thing as the body of Christ you speak of. For a Christian can't deny another wherever he sees him and wherever he finds him. It is the Spirit of God who bears witness with our spirit that we are his. They will have to find an answer. They will have to give an explanation. For unless they do, there will be a major revolution in the churches. <laughs> and there may be some preachers get stoned. Because if the truth is ever known by the people who are left, that the rapture really did happen, what's going to happen to that man who stands up there Sunday after Sunday and says there is no such thing? Who says there is no body? Who says there is no coming for the bride? Who says loyalty to this church is loyalty to Christ? And loyalty to our program is loyalty to Christ. And to desert this organization is to desert Christ. What's going to happen to that man if the truth is known? Well, it won't be good for him. It'll be bad, bad. So he's going to have to come up with an explanation, and he will. He will not disappoint the world. <laughs> they never have yet. Organized religion will solve the mystery of the rapture. I wish I knew what kind of a lie they'd tell, but I can't. <laughs> they said, in this case, the disciples stole them away. I have it. We discovered a secret plot. All these fanatical people got together and decided they'd go to moon and start a new colony. <laughs> and so they all took off in one rocket ship and disappeared. Well, uh, how those people clear down in Africa get together? Oh, details, details. <laughs> they worked it out. <laughs> Yes, yeah, space travel, you know, may be advanced by that time. So much so that it could be logically pawned off on the public that all of us went to the moon. We were sick of this society anyway, and right they are with that. Or there will be an explanation, and the results, it will be believed among the peoples of the earth to the very day that Jesus comes. For it is believed in general by the Jewish nation to this day that the body of Jesus was stolen by his disciples. That Paul the Apostle lost his mind on Damascus Road. That Christianity is nothing but a farce. That there is no Jesus. And there is no redemption by his shed blood. That's how well people who are taught by the religious world stay taught. It will be no different after the rapture. Wednesday night, We'll take up the subject, will any be saved? If so, will you be saved? Assuming that you will be here, let us pray. Father, we thank you for thy word this morning, for the precious truth that soon the Lord Jesus will come. We shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. We pray that if there are any in this meeting this morning who have never known the Lord Jesus Christ, they will rest in his finished work own him in their hearts now as Savior and Lord. Come to the conviction by the Holy Spirit that it is his righteousness and blood that makes men just in the sight of God. Oh, Father, we ask that you would forbid that there should be any loss from this assembly. We dare not assume that all in this assembly are Christians, Father. We must preach as though there were none in hopes that one might be saved. Bless that thy word may be used in our hearts in convicting power until Jesus comes. In his name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.